Well, welcome everybody. I think most of y'all have been on before, so welcome back. This is the last in the, well, I know it's May, but it was the last of the April series or whatever. So um, I guess I should tell you, first of all, that uh, thank you for doing the uh, survey. So I'm going to share with you the results of that. And we've gone ahead and got the next three Mondays planned, and that was based solely on what y'all chose. So um, there's one I'm not real keen on, but see, y'all are going to make me learn too and make me present on material that maybe I'm not as comfortable with. So it's going to be fun. We're just going to continue doing this uh, until maybe we get to see y'all face to face. So as of right now, though, I think that's August 1 is still our, our target date. But anyway, tonight what we're going to talk about is small space gardening. Uh, maybe hopefully give you some creative ideas to use in the garden if you're limited on space. Uh, we're going to talk about some vertical trellising systems and we're going to finish up with just some um, small tips on raised bed gardening. And again, this is where I kind of wish I could see everybody because I can only see five of you. Uh, but I, I'm just kind of curious who grows in ground versus raised beds versus containers, but maybe as we move through tonight, we can, uh, I can maybe get a handle on, you know, what everybody's doing, what your growing medium is. Uh, Jenny, I see you popped on. If you don't care, will you manage chat box as usual? Thank you. Yeah, if anybody has questions, just pop them in the chat box. When I go in presenter mode, I don't keep up with that. So I shove all that off on Jenny. So don't, uh, don't hesitate to, to put it there and she'll stop me or we'll get them at the end or, or whatever we need to do. So all right, so small space gardening. This is actually one of my uh, favorite presentations because um, you can just get really creative with with methodologies and mediums and, and ways to grow things. I'm going to have to move y'all because I can't see my screen. There we go. Okay, so just kind of starting out, let's, let's get comfortable. And when I'm talking about that, I'm just talking about whatever kind of pot or container, uh, potting medium, your location for pots. Uh, those are all things to consider when you get started growing, whether it's vegetables, um, even fruit. Y'all saw last week we can grow even blueberry plants in pots and strawberries and all kinds of different um, materials. So um, that's going to be critical as well as making sure we've got adequate sunshine at all times and of course water. Uh, when we do plant in pots, for those of you that are familiar with that and probably been doing it for a while, uh, watering is going to be critical. Uh, you're going to have to probably prune those plants throughout the season a little bit more than you would in conventional in-ground or even the raised beds. And then fertility can also be an issue. Uh, so as always, I'm going to put this information in the Google Drive and there's a handy um, handout on the fertility issues or fertility rates and things like that that breaks it down even into pots into raised beds or then a hundred square foot a thousand square foot so you'll have that at your disposal to use as well. Uh, we put this chart in here so you could see some of those container sizes if you're growing vegetables and pretty much Everything you see listed here from peas to peppers to squash, um, of course, tomatoes, all of those can be grown in pots. Typically, when we think about uh, pot gardening or um, container garden, we just think about tomatoes sometimes, the patio tomatoes. We don't think about uh, being able to grow carrots um, and, and broccoli, you know, any of those bra brassicas or the cold right. crops. But, but we can. We can grow pretty much anything in a pot if we are just real conscientious of of our production practices. So, um, but the first thing to consider is, is what happens to, um, to the soil in your pots in the springtime. And remember, and we've seen this here in the last few weeks, it's gonna warm up a lot quicker, uh, meaning that you can get your tomatoes and your peppers off to a little bit faster start than what those of us planting in ground could. Because again, you know, we want that soil temperature to be just right, or otherwise it's gonna stunt our tomato and pepper crops back. And then, of course, what is today? May the 4th. This is probably the coolest spring. And I think we broke records for the wettest spring so far. 
in the Tri-Cities. So, you know, it's kind of unusual. Mother Nature's been kind of throwing us a few curveballs in the last few years. But nonetheless, um, if we've got containers, then that soil is going to warm up quicker. It's going to warm up quicker in a raised bed uh, setting too, uh, quicker than it would be in a conventional ground system. Hey, Melody, we've got quite a few little comments in the in the chat box, so I'll read them. Okay. Um, we have people using raised beds, pots, and in-ground gardening. Okay. Um, let's see, Wolf says he's still trying to figure out which way to go. Property is red clay, so the question is to try and make red clay work, develop it for future, or just throw in the towel and go to raised beds. Um, I'm, I'm kind of with you, Wolf. <laughs> Self-watering containers, veggies, and flowers in the ground. Um, let's see. Uh, we have in-ground containers, old stock tanks, feed troughs, or square bales. That's interesting. I, I was mm -hmm. going to try square bales this year. Very cool. This is an innovative group. I like it. Yes. Well, th this you could even use with um, straw bale gardening. You know, if you want big fat tomatoes or stronger plants, then the key to that again is going to be pruning heavily. And it goes back to the last few classes we've talked about pruning. And oftentimes people get a little nervous about that, but you need to to prune, especially like suckers um, out of the tomatoes. Some people will let those go, but you don't want to push a lot of that uh, food energy into those suckers. You won't to push that energy into producing fruit. So if you keep those pruned away, then that's gonna help uh, that plant be more vigorous throughout the season and you're gonna have much healthier fruit in the long run. If you want those uh, stronger plants then you need to thin after you seed, that's just gonna give you a little bit more room. You've probably seen these pictures in the last um, month as we've gone through some of these presentations, both here and you know with, at the state level, but some of the potted pictures we've showed you, some of the herbs and things that you can sow, you still don't wanna have that super thick because fungal organisms can be an issue. Um, and then even sometimes salt uh, accumulation you know, a really thin layer of salt on the top of that pot can also be an issue. Um, again, the biggest hurdle uh, for folks is going to be watering. Uh, oftentimes, some of those, I heard some of you say that you had those cattle trough systems, you know, and, and we're going to get more involved with some of that here in a minute, but just making sure you've got an outlet for water. Um, I've had folks come into the office and not understand why one of their uh, container systems wasn't working and you get to asking questions and you find out they've not drilled a hole in the bottom they don't have any drainage and basically they've they've drowned the the plant and um, we've got to have some drainage in there and we've got to be watering ad adequately you know it's just a delicate checks and balances that we're trying to um, accommodate throughout the season uh, you'll notice there that I put that um, some tips in there check the soil a few times a day by sticking your finger as deeply as you can and if it feels dry where'd my camera go below the I can't even see myself on here <laughs> that first knuckle uh, then you need to water until that water runs out in the bottom of the pot and again notice that second bullet we don't want to be wetting the foliage if we can help it because again that's going to introduce uh, fungal pathogens and sometimes it can also introduce viral and bacterial which are sometimes a little bit tougher to control Oops. Okay, so I like this quote here. Half the interest of a garden is in the constant exercise of the imagination. And y'all have already been popping some things up there in the chat box. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot about thinking outside side the box and using what you have. We hear that new term today, upcycled materials, and, you know, we have to be innovative. We even had a small plot out here behind the extension office, I don't know, three or four years ago, showing folks some of these things that they could utilize in their garden and um, basically you know since I can't have you face to face uh -huh. you know, most of the time I would have folks come into the classroom and these things would be scattered around and people would be like why is there a diaper laying on this table or you know, so. <laughs> but it, it kind of adds to the creativity gets the juices flowing but all of these things you can actually utilize especially if you're growing in pots 
uh, those packing peanuts, if we're ordering now, which probably a lot of us are, um, having the grocery delivery from Sam's or Amazon or Walmart, Target or wherever, they put like one tiny little item in a great big box and oftentimes it'll either have that plastic wrap or there'll be peanuts in there. Well, you can use those styrofoam peanuts, which are not very good for the environment, but one way to recycle those is to use them in your big pots, especially if you don't have pots on rollers and it's hard for you to move them around. Basically all you're doing, it's making that pot a lot more lightweight, easier to maneuver around and it's providing- Careful though because some of those peanuts are biodegradable, they'll melt with water. So just, <laughs> just, just test one before you do that. <laughs> Please, I have to mess with my system all the time. Yeah, good point. Yeah, do the, do the float test first. <laughs> but to, but you, can, you can explore some other options to do that with um, and just put a layer, you can see there, that landscape fabric in between your soil and your medium, whether it be the, the peanuts or, or some of these other things we're going to talk about. And also it can help you save money. You're not having to buy as much of the potting mix, which can be beneficial. Uh, you can also line your flower part, uh, pots with coffee filters. That's going to help you keep that soil from falling out. You can use them in the hanging pots too that you see there or the baby diaper if you're using those to suspend. It's a really good way to be able to keep those uh, drainage and moisture levels a little bit more consistent throughout the, the season and you won't have just that constant drip, especially below if it's on your patio or your, or your deck. Uh, we have Another suggestion, and I've done this too, well, uh, and here I think we go, trash. Um, you can put upside down plastic or clay pots in the bottom of your big pots. And I've mm -hmm. actually done pieces of, you know, when pots have broken, put them in, in the bottom of the pots. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not one that likes to keep a lot of things, but if, if, if I can see a future use for it, I'll try to hang on to it and use it in some kind of garden setting like this but but yeah I'll take in if you don't if those peanuts are going to melt when you put water use old plastic bottles and do the same fill it up and you would do just like you would with those plastic peanuts put that layer of landscape fabric across the top and it makes it a whole lot less heavy and you're having to use less soil too and I like this quote too in the spring at the end of the day you should smell like dirt so we should all be smelling like dirt from this day forward, y'all. Okay, so what what all can you grow? And I mentioned some of these earlier on, but carrots and clay pots do really great. Um, I I grow primarily in ground, but like Wolf and Jenny were saying, clay is a big issue. The heavy clay soils here in East Tennessee, and it takes a while to amend that. Now I wouldn't say throwing in the towel because y'all have heard me preach on that. that clay is not all that bad. If I have any chemist in the group, they'll at least maybe sympathize with me a little bit there. But clay is not all bad because it's going to help um, help feed the plants ultimately at the end of the day. But if you've got a really heavy sticky clay that holds a lot of water um, before you can get that amended and you still like fresh carrots, you can grow them in a, one of those terracotta clay pots. They do a little bit better in the terracotta because they can, the terracotta breathes a little bit easier. But you know, if you've got a heavy clay soil too, carrots are one of those, whatever, when carrots are growing, whatever it hits, whether it's a rock or whatever, that's why you get those funky shaped carrots because they just stop growing. So that might be, you know, another thing, especially if you're growing for the markets, you, you'll get a more consistent growth that way. Uh, leaf lettuces and window box planters, or you can also again use the gutter system. And I've got some pictures of this as we move through here to give you some more ideas. Uh, cucurbit. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm sorry. Is That's there a rule of thumb for how much soil volume needed for the plant? Yes, that's in your handout. I can't remember what that is right off, but there's different um, pot sizes. There's a graph in there that tells you it breaks it down with the cubic okay. feet of the container with how much soil media is required. Got it. Good question. Mm -hmm. It's in the um, 
I think it's in the raised bed handout that you'll get at the end. Uh, cucurbits or anything that's a vine crop is going to do really well in containers. They can be quite prolific when they start running and it can also you know make your landscape or your garden a little bit more attractive too. If you're working with kids I think I saw Darlene on here a few minutes ago um, they've grown cucumbers and coke bottles and then also growing carrots. Something cool if you're you know teaching kids right now at home or whatever this is one of those fun ones to to play with of course it takes the carrots a little while to grow but it's kind of cool to be able to watch the roots um, grow and be able to see that transition so and the kids love doing that and you can kind of see what that looks like toward the end of the season Neat. <clears throat> um, this has become pretty popular just buying the potting mix and growing leaf lettuces or any of those mixed greens. Um, green onions, radishes also do well in this medium. And just making sure that you keep it consistently watered is gonna be the key. And also again, having the drain holes in those bags. I'm trying to point, oh here, let me use my mouse. Yeah, making sure you get them, you know, some drain holes on the underside of those bags. And of course, these are pretty simple, pretty basic, just um, using just the rectangular pots, different size of pots to grow just a simple herb garden. And then we've even got some of the zucchinis that are a little bit more dwarf size. They don't um, vine quite as big. Um, this was actually in our home garden trials a couple years ago. It's a pretty good consistent performer for East Tennessee little bit more compact so if you're growing in containers or race beds it makes a really good addition to that as well as some of these the bush slicer cukes and being able to trellis these in a pot or in the raised bed uh, may be a little bit easier actually than anybody that's growing in ground uh, you see that pot of gold swiss chard uh, the bush beans there they're uh, the roland it just they're very compact and those beans come off in a really nice cluster and then you can see that jade gem lettuce what that looks like and again it's also very attractive gardening makes home bodies of us all i figured that was pretty fitting for what we're living through right now so yeah this time of year i don't mind being a homebody uh, but again it's about upcycling various materials and I know some of the master gardeners here in Greene County have seen a lot of this because we've utilized these in a lot of projects and things just kind of tinkering around and some of these are actually set up at some of our projects but old Rubbermaid containers um, I don't want to get ahead of myself I'm trying to I can't remember if I've got some pictures but laundry baskets trash cans there's all kinds of different things that, that we can utilize to grow in and just like the uh, pots I was showing you earlier with the with the styrofoam peanuts or with the water bottles you can use that same approach here in one of these bins but you'll notice there the holes and I pop that in there to give you a good illustration one hole will not do it or even two holes won't do it because you're still going to have uh, waterlogged especially the more soil that you have in there then the greater the chances of that unless you just completely let them dry out. Uh, lasagna gardening, I kind of popped this in the middle of the presentation because this is um, pretty environmentally friendly. It's something easy we can use to be able to control weeds, uh, to utilize in a, in a raised bed setting. You can even do it in the larger pots or those troughs that you were talking about, but basically just almost like a compost pile of sorts that you're just layering those materials. And you'll notice that top layer of straw, even carrots, as long as being able to get that root down into that soil line to give the root adequate room to move, you can still be able to pull off um, carrots or even potatoes in this kind of medium. And I've got some better pictures of that here in a minute. So some of you have jumped ahead of me there, but you can see it, it just, <laughs> you can see some of those different uh, containers um, really cool to be able to use uh, old swimming pools the old plastic swimming pools is another one 
Um, I've seen bathtub, I've seen toilets in Eastern Kentucky that were used for planting pots. So, I mean, just, just whatever, but some of these can make really attractive, um, you know, pots for flowers, you know, depending on the look and feel that you're going for um, at your house. Some are just going to be um, economical and be efficient to place on the back deck. And we've seen a lot of su success with these. Uh, the, the biggest thing is, of course, anything that's going to be that dark and black in color is going to tend to heat up a little bit more. And so you may be watering something like that a little bit more prolifically through the summer than you would something lighter colored in plastic. Melody? Yeah. We have a question. Okay. Is there one recommendation over another for sweet potato plants? Um, I'm, I'm guessing that means actually growing the potato versus just the sweet potato vine. Right, Brenda? Growing the, you, you mean actually throwing off a crop of potatoes? Right. Oh yeah, um, sweet potatoes will really grow pretty much anywhere in any of these. It, um, if you're going to grow though the sweet potato, I would do instead of the peanuts or the plastic pots or plastic bottles I was showing you, I would use all soil for sweet potatoes or, or straw. You could even do, you know, the, the layers of straw and soil. I, but, hmm? Okay, I did potatoes and straw and they, they came out fabulous. I was so surprised. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, you know, sometimes they're a little bit smaller, but, you know, it's pretty fabulous. Again, just on this, make sure you get those drain holes in there. And I keep putting these pictures in there because oftentimes when you get to talking to someone that comes in the office or if we're at plant sales or at the fair or whatever, a lot of times that's going to be the issue when you get to talking to folks because when they, when they get into a disease situation and you're trying to kind of get to the root of that, oftentimes it's going to be related back to the water, lack of drainage and overwatering. And then of course, the next one is underwatering. It's just completely, you know, bone dry. But here they've actually layered and stacked those. So it's a really attractive herb garden there in the corner. And you can tell from these that they're a little bit older, probably just taken out of the barn and recycled. And I think somebody said this earlier, you could actually take some older pots and, and bury those in the ground. Um, you could do that like to confine horseradish or mints and things like that. You would want to bury these just a little bit deeper, but that would be a good method to use to be able to, you know, to again, kind of limit that plant from spreading. Uh, some other thing, you don't see these milk crates probably quite as often as you used to. They used to be really easy to get, uh, but you can actually stack these and grow potatoes in these. I wish I had a better picture of that, um, but you can line these with that landscape fabric to keep the soil from falling out of the holes. And it still gives, of course, adequate room for water to move through and you get good airflow. So it's, um, it's actually maybe a little bit healthier on the, the roots just because of the aeration factor there. And if you are growing in containers, um, even raised beds, pallets, that kind of thing. A, a, a roll of the landscape fabric is probably going to be a good investment. It's something you'll probably utilize at some point uh, through the growing season with those containers. And again, we, we see just the basic black pots. Um, I guess this is like a, I know you can get these for like a dollar at the dollar store. Uh, same thing with these laundry baskets, and you can see how they're starting to, to grow through there. You would heal the potatoes just like you would in ground, you know, but instead of raking up the soil, you'd be placing an extra layer in there as the season moves on. Or you can do this just with straw. You can do it in a straw bale, or you can actually just use straw as the media in the laundry basket. And, and again, these are going to do a little bit better just because of the the airflow and it's going to be easier to dig the potatoes in a system like that. Um, old recycle buckets are a good um, use or growing your tomatoes in those old buckets. Uh, kitty litter buckets, the square ones, um, just another 
way to be able to recycle and use those old trash cans. Um, I actually have used one of these big ones to bury in my garden later in the fall into the winter to be able to extend some of my uh, produce and actually we're going to talk about that in one of our next classes because that's there seems to be a lot of interest in that but if any of these um, taller trash cans can serve as a great trellis support it's going to be a little bit more of an investment there and kind of depends on the look and feel maybe of what you're going for but even pole beans are going to do good on a support like this because you got a little bit more um, support some people have a hard time trying to trellis um, pole beans because they can be so vigorous and get so tall and you'll notice I'm getting snarky with my picture there with the holes <laughs> you're starting to see that on every slide uh, but some of these are cool just utilizing old wheelbarrows and things like that uh, we've seen probably these with flowers and, and things in them but uh, you can even grow a rolling lettuce bed or herb garden which is pretty neat old colanders uh, do fabulous the, this is something too you know you can pick up at old thrift stores and just you know as long as you're keeping that clipped back that's going to keep producing throughout the season so if you're really limited on space or or even plant sales and things like that it would be cool to utilize the reusable shopping bags um, this is one of those freezer bags so you you know you gotta be careful again with the drainage on those but these pretty much you don't have to do anything with the water will run right th right through those as long as you take that plastic board out of the bottom of it and here's the swimming pools i think these are just really cool mm -hmm. Uh, but this one they've actually buried that and then uh, i should have put the after picture because they've gone back with rock and that's another good system you could use if you have um, i like a lot of mint i've got a lot of peppermint at my house and it just kind of grows everywhere i don't really try to contain it but if you were trying to do that then you could utilize a system like this and just go back and cover that up uh, but eventually you know the plants will fill that in and and take over uh, but you can see here they've even got some trellis supports in there as well and these are probably the, some of those compact varieties that i was showing you earlier and of course you can see this back here how they staked and trellis that and this is one of my favorites um you know you wouldn't want to want to probably do this on your house but if you got like a yard barn or a shed or something you could utilize an old guttering system um, and again strawberries do really well you can grow leaf lettuce actually let me show you this and here's some different ways that you can grow the lettuce see this was that picture before the picture you just saw uh, again drainage is going to be key i don't know if you can see here how these are kind of slanted that's for drainage purposes. So you need them at just a little bit of an angle. These two are angled. You just can't see that as much because those plants have filled in a little bit more. Just kind of depends on the angle of, of the camera there. But if you if you have space and on an old barn or shed or something, um, this is a good way to grow your plants up. This is also considered a, a vertical uh, trellising system, even though it is leaf lettuce because we are growing up so technically it falls under that category but some really unique ways to just grow greens and basic vegetables pretty inexpensive ways uh, the old shoe what you hang shoes in over your door i don't think i have a picture of that in here but you can drill a little hole in each one of those plastic pouches and fill fill those with soil and plant you an herb garden in that and you can see here like what you use in a pantry old coke bottles there's too much work involved with this but it's a <laughs> cool little picture how they've how they've done that there and again it, it doesn't have to be anything fancy like that first picture we saw this is you know on on the back side of a house where nobody else is going to see it but that you um but got some different things going in here old paint cans or coffee cans that you can utilize and then of course the old concrete cinder blocks um, i brought a, a bunch of those back 
when we moved my mom last fall and they're unsightly and ugly and heavy when you're moving a lot of them but again it's a good way to put a barrier in for some of those nuisance plants you don't want you don't want becoming invasive and so it might look a little uh, untidy at first but eventually some of those will fill in so strawberries here in a border uh, keeping the perennial separate from the annuals in the garden so that's another thing you can do with that too and you can see where he's installed the hoops here over his buckets so he can easily cover and uncover those as the season progresses so um, if, if you're growing in the pots in a system like that then you can get a couple weeks on the cool weather maybe not this year because nobody knows when this cool weather is going to be over but typically uh, you'd be able to get a, a couple weeks on your season extension there so you can see this one they've just built a an easy frame there to hang some old gutter cut that minimal work involved with that and again um, some folks will actually make these buckets self-watering and, and i don't think i have a picture of that to be able to show that better but you basically take a small you know one inch or smaller diameter pvc pipe because this is a fitting on the bottom of this that lifts up about an inch to two inches so you would pour the water down in that pvc pipe and then the, the roots would take that up through the bottom i should have put a better picture in there i don't know if i usually bring my bucket out to show at this point but so again it's all about being creative and, and thinking outside the container lots of cool little ways that you can grow all kinds of things you know the old doors come back in fashion a couple years ago so using those with suspended paint cans with annual plants uh, makes a really attractive setting and of course some of these things you can get for next to nothing at yard sales and things plant and succulents and that and it's something you can move around from place to place again the old colanders you can see the galvanized pot that it's sitting on and then um yeah what do these items have in common y'all saw the first one there the mesh bags that your citrus comes in or your onions comes in an old hammock old bras pantyhose t-shirts and sheets <laughs> huh they're all some sort of netting <laughs> <laughs> a bra <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> no, but those are all tools in your arsenal that you can grow vertical in your garden. So again, you know, we've been talking about all this upcycling from outside, cleaning out the shed, cleaning out the barn, you know, reusing those kitty litter buckets, whatever. But you can do the same thing from inside your house because we've, we've got the plants started, we got them planted, and now it's time, you know, to grow those plants up. So of course, anytime that we're growing vertically you hear me talk a lot about um, the splash contact on the plant you know it's, when it rains we don't want to have bare ground you know like with this cantaloupe because of course that's going to splash pathogens up on your fruit which can yield to rotting invite insects in and then you just get this vicious cycle so the more that we can grow anything up then the better off we're going to be in the garden or if you are growing on bare ground making sure that we've got some kind of mulch cover there to help protect that but this is one of those old produce bags just recycling that um, trellising this on a support and tying it off into a net bag you can also if you're using a hog panel as your um, support system for vine crops then you can just use pantyhose to string um, sugar baby watermelons you, I mean even those little baby boo pumpkins the pumpkin or the pie pumpkins all of those will sling really nicely and pantyhose or an old t-shirts and old sheets that you can rip up you can see there that one's that's a sugar baby watermelon it's starting to pop out at the seams but it's so much easier too on you for harvesting it's kind of tough to get that trellis system in place especially if you're putting it up at the beginning of every year and taking it down every year but if you are um you know growing vertically you can see how much easier that's going to be for you to to harvest that fruit as well 
And here's just a picture of an old hammock that they've used. And they just made a hammock here out of the pantyhose. And you can see that growing in the pot. And they've got, a, of course, one of the tomato cages there. And I'm just going to use that to support that fruit as it grows bigger. And these are my favorites, using old bras. <laughs> There you go, Wolf. This is <laughs> but I mean, seriously, they work. So, you know, you don't want to be, uh, I mean, if you've got some of these laying around or, you know, the old bikini tops, put them to good use. So, um, you know, get your fruit up off the ground. And again, you can see how that one's slung. <laughs> and there's the pumpkin I was talking about. I thought I had a picture. So it's pretty cool because especially pumpkins, you know, the later we get into the season, pumpkins are really affected by the squash bug. So if it's on the ground, it's going to be about 50 to 75 percent more likely to have squash bug damage. So again, if we can raise that fruit up, we're helping reduce that insect potential. And then you can kind of see how all that looks when you start slinging a lot of fruit, what that's going to look like. But the cool thing, too, that this is going to allow, it's almost like three sisters contained on a trellis. Or, you know, maybe the wire is serving as the corn or the sunflower. And so you can also grow green beans in the, mid, in the midst of this, have that mingling through there. Uh, cucumbers. Of course, cross-pollination, that might be an issue. But again, these things are going to be really easy to harvest. You just go out there and, and cut off the, the pantyhose. Uh, this is just a small in-ground system here, but you could also adapt this to a raised bed uh, setting as well. Of course, there's some money in that. You can see from the, all that lumber there. Uh, so you, you don't have to be quite that fancy. Uh, you can even utilize old ladders um, to, to build some of those support beams or even the old pallets. Uh, you can see there that's pretty much all flowers, but again, strawberries are gonna do really well in this setting. You can lean those up, and the, the landscape fabric, this is where that's gonna come into play too. Uh, we would staple the landscape fabric on the back side of this, and then even on the sides, this one looks like it's solid, but if you get those that, are, that have the, the holes on the side, you can just staple that up along the side and it'll help contain that. Um, or you can lay these down flat on the ground, either way, but um, you can also put in some trailing um, plants here and nobody would ever even know that's a, a pallet garden. And again, just some more ideas to show you how to get as much of that foliage and the fruit up off of the ground as you can. And you can kind of see where these blooms are coming right here, so eventually that's going to be fruit so it's going to again be lifted but you also see they've got a cover here of mulch too and the straw in between here so anything to to shield us from that that soil splash is going to be uh, it's going to behoove us to do that because you've heard me talk a lot of times when when we have certain pathogens we can't get rid of them and if we have pressure one year then we know that's going to be an issue we're always dealing with uh, these are probably old tomato stakes or tobacco sticks that they've just made a tripod out of. Uh, there's a lot of the tobacco sticks laying around in many barns these days since tobacco is almost non-existent here. So you could probably find a farmer who had some of those and get some because you can utilize those in various ways throughout your, your garden. You can even use those as an overhead support um, as well as making the TPs or the tripods. So, and then it just adds dimension and texture to your garden and it frees up a lot more space too. Plus it's also gonna allow you um, the opportunity to grow some more of those lower growing plants that we might not think of growing very well in July and August, like those leaf lettuces or even radishes, because you know how they can tend to get woody. But if they've got a lot of shade in the high temps of the summer months, you, you can still pull off a pretty good crop of those. And you can see how this is just old sticks they've gathered. But again, just getting creative to get as much of that up off the soil as possible. And I think this is the, is an old ladder 
maybe, yeah. And then you can see some other uses of the ladder here. Uh, so pretty simple, ineffective ways. Uh, the other thing, you know, of course, with cucumbers are the cucumber beetles, on the striped and the spotted. We have a lot of pressure with that in East Tennessee. So again, the more that we can get those up and, and plant some of those beneficials that we talked about a couple of weeks ago and get more air movement through there, it's going to confuse those cucumber beetles and they tend to not want to nibble quite as much um, as they would in those tight clusters on the ground. And of course, tomato, uh, you can do that, use a ladder just to help support a couple of tomato plants that are just unruly. And then just some different ways to utilize some of those old ladders laying around. How many summer, see I like to be, this is when it gets to me, but how many are using a um, vertical system? I don't know why I'm asking this, I can't really see, but. We have uh, some, Mary grows, has grown cantaloupe on her lattice work on her back porch. Yeah, lattice, that's a good one too. Anybody else do anything cool with vertical? How are you growing the cucumber, squash, and beans, Eileen and Nancy? I'm just curious because, uh, you know, <clears throat> y'all have heard me say before, it's, it's a two-way street, learning from y'all as much as you learn from me. So it's kind of cool to see and hear what others are doing. Lori's using cattle panels this year for gourds, squash, and making tunnels green beans on gate panels, cucumbers on wagon wheels. That's cool. Oh, cool, yeah. That is neat. Huh. I tried um, cattle panels or hog, hog wire, I guess, yeah. um, last year, and, and it's rusty. And it's I was concerned that maybe that was a problem for the plants, but I think more the um, Mexican bean beetle got mine <laughs> badly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to try it again this year and see if I can't get ahead of it. Okay. But yeah. Oh, it, washer and dryer tubs. A what oh, that's cool too. A washer and dryer. Uh, Jean uses old, uses heavy duty fencing and old washer and dryer tubs. Oh. See, cool. Are, are all these in the chat box? Yes. That's cool. I'll share that with y'all too. I'll save that chat and put it in the Google Drive. So if you have some cool ideas on anything we've talked about, pop it in there. Uh, yeah, um, I took old cattle panel kind of like this out of the livestock trailer and used it, just cut it with a welder, different sizes. <laughs> it's not too pretty, but you know, it serves its purpose. It looks ugly initially, but once it gets covered up like this, you can't really tell what it is. So, and, and again, if you're, you remember how we talked a couple weeks ago about planting multiple varieties of cucumber. So if you have some heavy pressure, heavy infestations of cucumber beetles and things, um, it'll help confuse them too. They'll, they'll prefer those English versus some of the picklers and things, just kind of depending on what your preference is, but really check into that because um, you're basically just sacrificing a couple cucumber plants for the bugs. Okay, so um, that was some of the fun stuff, just cool ideas to be able to grow. So even if you are growing in the ground, incorporating some of these ideas, um, it's just kind of fun to play around with and, and see what you can get away with and see what works and see what, what doesn't. Or sometimes it's a game to see, well, I wonder what I could use that for. I bet I could grow this and that. Or, um, you know, it's just, it's just kind of fun to see what you can, what you can use. So, uh, but for those of you that, that do have raised beds, and again, I'm gonna give you our handout. We just um, edited that, re redone that entire publication at the end of last year. So it's brand new, got brand new stuff in it. So really look at that. It's just about five or six pages. It's got a lot of useful information in it. So I wasn't gonna spend as much time on that since you'll have that as a reference. But just to pull out some, 
big tips, I guess, is, is just because it's topsoil don't mean it has organic matter. So some of you have heard me preach on the organic matter and the soil. Some of you haven't had that luxury. Sorry, guys, maybe one day. <laughs> but um, organic matter is probably going to be really critical for your raised beds. Um, some folks are going to utilize the soil that's in their raised bed. Some people are going to kill that back and, and start with their own mixture and in and any of that's fine but irregardless of of what soil we're using we do want to make sure that we're incorporating organic matter because that's what's going to help build our our soil in those beds and that's what's going to help basically feed our plants through the season so uh, you do want to be aware of compacted soil some people don't <clears throat> think about that being an issue with raised beds. Um, you want to think about that third knuckle rule, add peat, peat as necessary. Peat's going to be one of those um, amendments that's going to give you good drainage, or you hear me sometimes refer to it as fluff. It's going to help fluff that soil. Um, but the organic matter and building your soil tilth, even in a raised bed, is going to be critical because we all know that anything that we're, we're growing, it all begins with that with that soil and you heard me say that last week in blueberries you've heard me say that in strawberries we've got to get a good start before we plant the first seed or before we set that first transplant in a pot raised bed in the ground you know what whatever we're doing so just like in a raised bed it may take us some trial and error it may take us a little time to, to figure out what that what that balance is for us to utilize, especially if you're using topsoil from in and around your house. Um, but again, just always be cognizant of the fact organic matter is going to be something that you need to utilize. And I just gave away my question there. If you add peat, what do you most likely need to add and why? And of course, maybe I didn't give that away. Y'all didn't see it, did you? Anybody know what the answer is? Nitrogen. Nope. If you add peat, what do you need to add? And this is the thing with raised beds. A lot of folks don't think about this and it's, it's you know, nothing bad on any, anybody's part, but peat is going to raise the pH of, of your soil media naturally. Mm -hmm. So even adding lime is going to help adjust the, the pH. And I didn't put a slide in here, but Last year when, when Robert Florence was, was hired in our soil lab or two years ago, you know, we completely redid the soil lab and some of you may have experienced the soil test, the new ones in the last couple of years. And literally we as home gardeners were pulling our hair out because it's like, oh my Lord, that is not even relevant to what we're doing. So Robert was really good to work with us and we were able to get a modified uh, soil test for home gardening as well as a basic media test. So if you utilize the extension office to do those soil tests, make sure that you're, you know, specifying if it's a, a media versus soil for the home garden and just be aware that there is a, a difference there. So um, probably most of your agents have, have told you that, but just be aware of that because it's going to give you a, a lot better recommendation than what our old typical soil test would do. But again, just be aware that peat's going to raise that pH, so you're going to need to, to add lime to help pull that back where it needs to be. And I always like to throw this picture in there just to show you how critical that pH is. Um, and I'm not going to go into the chemistry tonight, Green County folks, so don't worry. But you can see the difference there. You know, we want our, our garden veggies to be at about a 6.5 to 6.8. But look, look what happens when our pH gets way off. Now, blueberries, we're going to want right here. It's going to look totally different. But for our garden site, you know, this is where we want to be hidden. So if that pH is too low, then we're binding up other nutrients. They're not going to be available or some are going to be too available and we're going to have some toxic effects that are going to start showing up. So no matter what you're doing, in ground, raised bed, think about that, that soil pH. And then I just put this um, in there for your reference to have, again, whether it's raised bed or, or in ground, just the different um, types or materials that lime come in 
um, and you can kind of see how what that equivalent is going to be so you'll just have that for reference and of course that pelletized lime we always preach about doing those soil tests in the fall and same way with your raised beds if you're looking to to move to raised beds or you know just getting started with those make sure you spend the time getting that soil built just like you would in a, in the ground but it's not too late to get a lime application on there because you can get the pelletized it's a little bit more expensive but it's going to be easier to spread um, so your, your reaction time is going to be a lot faster too with this than it would be with the traditional ag lime that we're adding in the fall Melody. Yes. Um, yes. We have a couple of questions. Are, are we still doing soil tests in the extension office? Yes. Okay. Which county is that? Mary, are you green? Hawkins. Okay. Um, is that in the chat box? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure what, what everybody's schedule is on that. Um, we were doing our but huh. green is, is that what yes. you're saying? Yes, okay. they um, had been going out on Fridays. Um, after last Friday though, that may change to Wednesdays, but we meet tomorrow on that, so green, green counties may change. I'm not sure what some of the neighboring counties are doing, but um, if nothing else, just reach out to your ag agent and, and inquire when they're taking those samples in. But, or you can actually, if you have boxes, you can send those directly to the lab yourself. Um, but if you don't have the boxes in the sheets, uh, you'd still need to be able to get those. But uh, the sheets you can pull actually offline. That's a good question. I need to see if I can get with the agents and just maybe pop that in the Google Drive maybe before the end of the week. That would be great. Yeah. And one more clarification. Um, I, you, you may have said it a different way but peat lowers the pH correct um, or the the lime say it again say peat's gonna raise the pH so peat. like it it's gonna kick you well uh, no wait wait a minute I see what you're saying now <laughs> yeah, I, I do that, have that wrong yeah it looks like a mistake yeah, oh, well, I can't change that right there. That is a, hang on a minute. I'm writing that down so I can go in there and change that. You're right. It does lower the pH. And that's why you have to add the line. Yes, I'm okay. sorry. I'll change that before I put it in your Google Drive. Okay. I was trying to thank do that right now, but it ain't gonna let me do that. But thank you for that. Okay, so the other question, wait a minute, let me write this about soil test in counties. So I don't forget. If I forget, one of y'all send me an email. It will not hurt my feelings. Hawkins County. Mary Carr. All right, so um, another question we get a lot of times is about utilizing wood ashes. And um, I personally like to use wood ashes, especially if I'm growing peppers, because I think it gives them a boost of, of potassium. Uh, but you can kind of see the breakdown there. It's about 1 to 2% phosphorus and 4 to 10% potassium. Hardwood ashes are going to be about 45% of that carbonate equivalent, back, referring back to that chart that I just showed you. So that's going to be about half effective as lime. And then just remember that softwood ashes are going to be less effective than the hardwood but you're going to need a lot of that is the bad thing because wood ashes is just going to be too fine to improve that soil structure even over time uh, but if you're you know if you've got a wood stove and you're utilizing that or if you're burning off a, a brush pile of just your hardwood in your garden just remember that is a good place to, to plant peppers they do like that um, but if that's something you want to use, again, just make sure you're, you're doing the soil test to know exactly how much you're, you're adding because a lot of our soils here in Greene County, you're not going to have to add any potassium or any phosphorus because they're going to be naturally high. But that's going to vary all over uh, northeast Tennessee. That even varies pretty, pretty widely here in Greene County. 
another thing we always get question on <coughs> is the green manure versus vermiculite. And I'm a true believer in, in growing green. And of course, that's going to be a, a cover crop of some sort. But that vermiculite is not going to break down quite as fast. Um, you're not going to be able to build that tilth quite as quickly as you would if you added a cover crop. And of course, cover crops are going to be a little bit harder to do in the raised bed setting. Um, but even if you can incorporate something, you know, I mean, if, you, if you're not growing vegetables throughout the season, I mean, throughout the year, 12 months a year, then make sure you get something green on those raised beds. But especially you can just turn that under and, and do it just like you would do in a conventional in-ground garden. Uh, we want to get something on there uh, to just keep help building that soil tilth. So just be mindful of that. Um, be cautious, you know, with what you're using. You can use a, a legume like your clover, um, even the vetch, because vetch is one of those that we put in ground. It can tend to get a little bit invasive, and of course, birds are going to help spread it. But if you're if you're doing it in a raised bed setting, of course, right now it's growing prolifically, and it's beautiful and got the nice pretty blooms. But I wouldn't want to be messing with it right now. But when we're turning those crops under about a month or six weeks ago. Then we're still reaping the, the benefit from that. It's just not going to be quite as cumbersome to deal with right now. So um, even util utilizing rye, um, rye is going to have that um, alleliopathic effect that's going to help suppress uh, germination of, of weed seeds. So um, they are going to help serve a purpose rather than just the biomass. Um, add that compost and you'll notice there we'll talk about that soon. I think that's going to be one of the June topics. Um, remember it's all about converting that dirt to soil. You know the uh, dirt's what's on the bottom of your shoe. We want to turn that into soil that's going to be usable uh, for all of our plants needs. And remember that raised beds are going to add those few weeks before planting. Uh, but not in the fall because you're going to lose some precious new nutrition. When you do that so uh, use all your leftover healthy plant residues you know when you're uh, deadheading or or cutting back those plants you can utilize that kind of as like a compost bin of sorts if you have a raised bed or a big container uh, just making sure you you utilize all that eventually you're going to turn that into to plant food melody we have a question yes what is the difference between potting soil, raised bed soil, and garden soil? Well, I don't think I've ever heard of the raised bed soil. Are they marketing something like that? Yeah, they are. <laughs> are you uh, well, I don't know about the raised bed soil, but garden soil versus, what was the other one? Potting soil. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about potting soil, you gotta be careful, is that sometimes it will already come charged fertility, which is not gonna be good. For some crops so I typically will tell folks if you're if you're going with potting soil make sure you're not buying like the miracle grow or something in it you want to be in charge of your own fertility as much as you can when you're growing in pots or in the raised bed so that would be my first tip um, second off the the garden soil is going to be more like a, a top soil versus the potting soil which is going to have the blend of peat vermiculite and soil and sometimes again the fertility. Um, I'm not sure what the raised bed is but often if you can combine those two if you're just initially getting started and adding some extra compost or leaves or even some sawdust anything like that to help chunk up that soil and and provide a good mixture that potting soil if you're only using that water is going to just continually run right through that it's great for just pots but if you're in a raised bed you're going to run into an issue where you're going to have a lot more cresting going on so you're going to get more bulk with the garden soil um, even adding some of that i think it's a yellow bag of black cow manure or if you're fortunate enough to have manure, adding that to, incorporating that in as you mix your own soil for your raised beds is a good way to go. So um, even in, in containers, even in the pots, if you're mixing the potting soil with the, the garden soil, it's not a 
it's not a bad way to go because again you're getting more density and a little bit more spread on your roots that way um but if it's you know the smaller pots you can get away with just using potting soil does that answer your question william Where's this raised bed soil? Yeah. I guess that's at Lowe's or anywhere like that. Because I've seriously not seen that, so I'll have to investigate that. I'll see what I can find out. Shoot, where have I seen it? Lowe's or Tractor Supply? Hmm. And it could very well be gone by now. <laughs> I don't want to um, major a guess, but I'm thinking it might be more of a mix, what I was just talking about. It may be a mixture of. Mostly. Are there any watch outs for sawdust? Uh, well, you don't want to do oak in a garden, do you? No, you're going to get real acidic with that. Right. Um, well, number one, I wouldn't use a lot of sawdust. Um, I would use it to incorporate just initially to get that soil built. Um, but you want it to be aged down just like we would age down manure. You know, we want it to be composted. We don't want it hot. Um, you know, like going down and or going and cutting out a down a tree in the backyard that's got blown over by the wind, and then running that through and using that as sawdust. We we don't want to do that right now. Just make sure that it's aged down, uh, and don't don't use a tremendous amount of that. Again, just enough to give it some bulk to help those microbes and stuff break break that soil down. That makes sense. Okay. Um, one thing too just about fertilizer and, and you're going to have this in your in your handout to refer back to but um, just remember that synthetic is going to provide you a quick boost um, but you're going to lose that really quickly and, and a lot of that's going to be tied back um, both directly and indirectly to to your soil again whether you're in ground or in those raised beds or whatever so just be cautious with those synthetic um, you, you can you can lose as much as what you're you're putting on and just be conscientious of the fact that's not going to help you build soil tilth or structure over time and we want to go after that same effect in a raised bed setting as we do in ground because we're going to be utilizing that from from year to year recycling our ground um, but if you're you know utilizing some of these organic fertilizers bone meal blood meal and some things like that be be cautious fish emulsion they, they can draw in um nuisance pest so just remember remember that uh, but when you're adding organic nutrients it's going to linger it's going to be more of a slow release and oftentimes in a raised bed setting we've seen that a combination of those two will benefit you and actually in that handout it's going to share with you some of the results that we've that we've seen and we've actually got some of that in trials this year that we're looking at so hopefully we'll have some more info on that next year uh, the last thing on raised beds is uh, just to maybe purchase a bag of rock phosphate it, a little dab will do you for a long a long time um, most of your garden centers are going to well I'm not, let me not say garden center. I'm not sure if Lowe's or Walmart, the box stores have this. I've seen it at Tractor Supply. I've seen it at Co-op, at, at our, our local hardware store here, Burl's Feed Store. Um, but the rock phosphate is just good to have uh, for raised beds because you can have a lot more leaching um, of, the, of the phosphorus. So if we're boosting plants with adequate phosphorus nutrition, then that's where we get that that slow steady vigorous growth and we're going to get a little bit of an earlier maturity we don't want to push too much that's why i'm saying a little dabble do you if you buy one bag of this you can literally get about five to ten years depending on how many raised beds you have um, but basically when you give that little push of phosphorus then you're going to get larger fruit and vegetables in the fall typically and earlier maturing crops are going to be less susceptible to summer drought disease and infestation and frost so one way to think about it is it's turning on that plant's immune system and you can see here that it's also really rich in minor elements and by minor it's those 
that are down way deep in the soil and plants only need small quantities of those for optimum growth. Um, but it's, it's going to provide, again, that little bit of boost. And it's going to give you a slow release feeding. Um, and it's only going to become available to, to those plants as that plant needs it, which is pretty cool. So again, if you're in raised beds, it's a good, good investment to just purchase and make sure you keep it stored in a dry location and it should last you for several years. What are you, um, what are your thoughts around composting in the raised bed? Um, mostly coffee grounds, banana peels, and eggshells. Are you talking an active growing? See, or are you talking about like in the off season? Now I can see everybody again. I'm thinking active growing. Is that what you were talking about, Mary? Active, yes. Um, I, I mean, I don't, the only thing I would worry about is coffee grounds are going to be a little acidic. You know, could banana peels draw in some nuisance pests we might not want to deal with. Um, but other than that, I don't really see a problem as long as you're turning that under. I, I will do that my, myself starting in the fall once I get my cover crop on I just basically turn it into a compost pile and there's a area in my in my in-ground garden that I kind of do that with throughout the season because it doesn't really grow anything else so I'm trying to build that area up so you could do that diatomaceous earth yeah where'd it go? I know it's good for fleas and and bugs and things like that but what else were you, what else would you use it for um that is good for insects it's basically basically fossilized pieces of the earth but you can utilize it for caterpillars any kind of soft body mm -hmm. insect it kind of when they ingest it it cuts them up basically <laughs> slugs yes exactly so it is um that's a that's a good investment too to have in the garden good point de actually i'm gonna write that down and put that in there in that google drive too so you'll have that to refer to good questions good ideas <laughs>